I'm struck, uh, Raj, by the fact that it sounds like it takes longer to fill out the paperwork than it does to do the procedure. It's uh, sort of the natural trajectory of medicine these days, I guess. Uh, it's always difficult to uh, uh, follow Peter Licht onto the stage, as, as Peter is always very thorough in uh, re uh, um, researching this uh, topic. I've uh, had the privilege of uh, doing this once before. I doubt that I'll add a great deal. Uh, I think I'll probably confirm some of the points that he's made. Uh, it's also a great pleasure for me to be on the uh, uh, at the podium uh, with sharing it with two other Danish surgeons, not only because they're outstanding uh, thoracic surgeons, but it's my ancestral heritage uh, to having come from Denmark, so I'm honored and privileged to be here. Um, does VATS improve outcomes? Um, I, the other thing I'd say is that I've been around long enough that uh, I sat in the audience uh, when they first did, they presented the series on cis uh, lobectomies, and the horror of that procedure, watching that, compared to the elegant uh, surgery that you see now is a real testament to uh, those who have persisted, who've refined it, who've demanded it be done in a proper way in an anatomic fashion, and the elegant uh, procedures that are now performed that we get to witness is a true credit to the persistence and talents of those who've uh, pursued this. Um, so the same question, uh, I've picked and chosen, uh, much as some of the reports themselves uh, have uh, uh, surgeon bias, and that will be taken into account, but I think it reflects sort of my general perspective on this uh, whole area. This is from Tommy D'Amico, uh, recognized as one of the uh, more enthusiastic uh, people about uh, VATS lobectomy. He uh, published this not too long ago and said these are some of the contraindications. Each, I think, passing year, uh, we find new things that can be done uh, with this technique, and it clearly has been a transformative procedure in our uh, field. And he admits that as the indications have increased, the conversion rate has also increased, and, and probably properly so. Um, my feeling about this issue of uh, uh, some of the catastrophic complications that occur, uh, they will improve, obviously, in those who gain more experience, but as those who come along and try to learn, they will have to reduplicate that learning experience. So. Uh, I'm certain that we will continue to see these sorts of things. We certainly see them in uh, referrals uh, within our area of people who've started doing these and things that uh, really are, are hard to understand but continue to uh, present themselves. I think one of the challenges as well as dissemination of this technique is that uh, you have uh, certain circumstances that exist. Uh, those surgeons who finish their training without the benefit of being exposed to these types of procedures. You have those who were exposed but didn't get to do it as their uh, trainers, if you will, were learning the technique themselves. And so I think it will always be a bit of a challenge for this to migrate uh, into general practice. Uh, not too long ago at one of our postgraduate courses, there was a person who stood up in the back of the room and he said, well, it's easy for you to talk about doing vatsylbectomies. You have residents, you have plenty of nurses, PAs, uh, assistants, uh, excellent and skilled anesthesiologists. I work by myself in private practice, and the thought of me doing a, a procedure like this with a, a nurse assistant uh, and a CRNA is quite daunting. So uh, there are challenges that exist within the community that don't exist in the big academic centers. Within our own institution, uh, I just looked up before I came over, for 2015 we're now up to 72 percent of uh, lobectomies that are done uh, via VATS approach. Uh, you can see that I think our experience has been uh, excellent. Uh, we've had uh, 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 a four-day median stay, uh, atrial fibrillation 11 percent, air leaks uh, less th or greater than five days at 5 percent and no mortalities and that continues through 2015. So we've maybe been slower to adopt it initially, uh, looked at it uh, very carefully, I think went about it in a reasonable, responsible way, and now, as I said, uh, do over 70% of the clinical stage one lung cancers uh, with uh, VATS techniques. Um, this just shows the difference uh, through the STS database through uh, two different time frames, and you can see the difference here. Here they are roughly equivalent, and uh, in the next uh, three-year time uh, period, uh, they uh, had almost doubled uh, compared to the uh, open lobectomies. This clearly is a function of selection bias and who contributes to the STS database. Overwhelmingly, it's the large centers, the academic centers, 
where more and more VATS procedures are done. And as we heard earlier, if you look at different databases, you see the uh, proportion to be quite different. And uh, in America, I don't know what it's like uh, in the rest of uh, uh, Europe, but certainly there are still many general surgeons who perform thoracic surgery in the community. So when you look at large, inclusive databases in the United States, you're not only looking at thoracic surgeons, you're looking at general surgeons. But I do think it reflects this issue of training, when you trained, where you trained, whether or not this has uh, fully migrated into uh, general practice. Uh, this was, I, I referred to this earlier, uh, that uh, as those who learned the technique became comfortable doing it, they could then uh, translate that into the residents. You heard today from Shanda Blackman, who said that all of her residents now do these procedures under her guidance. And initially, I'm sure that Shanda did them herself so that she could become experienced. This just shows that with some uh, experience of trainees, an experienced trainer, uh, that the trainees can do as well, if not better, uh, than their uh, mentors. Uh, this gets into the issue of uh, as you gain more experience, the conversion rate uh, reduces. Uh, this is a, uh, a single unit experience uh, over this period of time. Um, and you can see that with time and experience, uh, their conversion rate diminished, uh, as I think is true of most. Uh, these were the reasons they were converted, a vascular problem and an anatomical problem or the presence of lymph nodes that uh, dictated uh, conversion. Interestingly, once they converted, at least as they measured complications, uh, those who were converted, not surprisingly, had the same incidence of complications as those who had an open procedure, and more so in their experience than those with a VATS procedure. If we look at complications and mortality, Again, you can almost pick and choose uh, whichever side of the argument uh, you want to come down on this, and I think that's part of uh, the emphasis on a randomized study to answer these questions. Uh, to me, that really is the take-home message that, uh, if anything, I impart, much as Peter did earlier. Uh, it's the notion that this procedure has reached a point where to answer these questions is really important. Uh, it's important to uh, know what the real results are. Uh, it's important to be able to discuss it with patients in an open, honest way. Uh, and I think it uh, really is something that uh, does uh, demand that we do that. Uh, this was to look at uh, the issue of uh, uh, sinus rhythm and atrial fibrillation. This was from Memorial Sloan Kettering. Uh, they took 122 matched pairs based on age and gender. Uh, again, uh, that is really what we find in place of uh, randomized control studies. And later on, you'll see a, a recent study that, again, used propensity matching uh, and the limitations of that statistical uh, uh, gymnastics, if you will, to substitute for a randomized controlled trial. Uh, here they found no difference, um, and they did admit that those who had VATS procedures had a much more favorable DLCO. They uh, less had less induction therapy, and the implication was that maybe with that, uh, these patients should be expected to do better in terms of the incidence of atrial fibrillation. Here's a single institution, propensity matched, equal numbers, high rate of complications, and you'll see in later uh, studies, complications, it all depends on the definition and how hard you look for them, uh, quite a high rate of uh, complication, both in the VATS and open group. But when you compare uh, these three parameters, uh, certainly in favor of the open procedure, uh, a, an operative mortality of 5%, probably uh, uh, the STS database is under 2% now, so that would be called into question. Uh, um, an open mortality of that high. This again is from a much bigger uh, database of community hospitals now, not necessarily just a single academic institution. They looked at different things. Uh, here you see the average length of stay, quite long. Uh, I'm reminded when I see this that uh, 20 years ago uh, we were asked to re-engineer our service to try to reduce the length of stay and overall cost. It's the first time we ever looked at anything like that, and the average length of stay for lobectomy that, at that time was nine days. And with paying attention, the development of clinical pathways, that figure was reduced to five 
Uh, I think that's a, one of those things that enters into all of the reports and uh, efforts in this area. It's hard to uh, factor in the motivation of the surgeon. A surgeon who's taking on a new technique, I think, is highly motivated to show that it's superior to other techniques. It's very hard to control for that. I think that if people paid attention, um, uh, if they prefer to do it open, uh, much the same way that those who are interested in doing it in the VATS technique, they would improve those patients who have open procedures. Philippe Dartveld mentioned to me uh, as he left this morning that in Paris, they have a fast track approach to open lobectomies, uh, and that their results comparing VATS and open using that approach, getting patients out of the hospital in three days, the results of those two comparisons are essentially the same. So surgeon motivation, uh, all of that uh, benefits the patients, and I think those who uh, feel more comfortable doing an open procedure ought to pay more attention to pain, to things to improve the uh, post-operative uh, care of these patients. But again, this you see maybe a slight uh, more favorable uh, finding in terms of intra-op complications with mortality sort of in the same three to three and a half percent range. Uh, this is again looking at the STS database, um, looking at uh, post-operative complications. Here are large numbers of patients. Here's their incidence of complications. Uh, you'll see in a subsequent slide over the same time period a different figure for complications. Um, and when you then compare them, there clearly is seemingly a benefit uh, to VATS. Not dramatic, but clearly a trend to show that it's improved. And here it shows the operative mortality in that, uh, in that uh, interval of time in the STS database under 2%. Uh, this uh, is now looking at a slightly different issue, but the same time frame, the same relative number of patients in, in the ratio. Here, the, the overall complication was now 21%, so they had a different definition of what they considered to be complications. Again, more in the open group, but if we use that for the previous study, it would have been highly significant compared to the 30-some percent complication rate uh, published by the uh, previous authors. Um, but here they found something that's interesting. And uh, again, this is true of almost everything that I can remember during my career, that when you subject something to uh, rigorous analysis, uh, what seems like, uh, uh, and I had this conversation again in the hall today, something that comes along and you expand the indications enormously, and then you do it and you can track to find out exactly where it's absolutely the, the proper procedure to do. And maybe this is an example of that. So uh, if the FEV1 predicted is less than 60%, many more complications in the open group compared to the VATS. If it was greater than 60%, there was really no difference. Uh, this is uh, morbidity and mortality. Again, looking at the STS database, uh, for those who have FEV1 and DLCO predicted less than 40%, Again, uh, something that at least indicates there's um, a more favorable outcome when using the VATS approach um, uh, in this group of patients who have a lower DLCO and FEV1. Again, maybe again, this is the kind of patient where this is absolutely uh, the, the indication for doing a VATS approach. Uh, this is a meta-analysis. Now, looking... It's done in 2009. Peter does a much better job of looking through the world's literature. Uh, I uh, cheated and used this one guy who did it uh, all by himself, uh, looking at 21 studies, two, only two of which were randomized, and found no difference in air leaks, arrhythmias, pneumonia, mortality, or local recurrence, but an improvement for VATS of systemic recurrence and, and mortality, suggesting that maybe there was some selection bias that they were more favorable patients compared to those who had open procedures. How about pain and quality of life? It's certainly a strong argument uh, that those uh, who prefer to do VATS procedures try to make. Um, this was taken from an American College of Surgeons study, uh, but it looked at uh, longitudinal quality of life in high-risk patients and uh, showed that VATS was associated with improved physical function at three months and dyspnea scores at 12 months. Again, high-risk patients, uh, maybe there's some benefit. This is counterposed to this, which found that uh, looking at uh, um, VATS versus anterior thoracotomy in a retrospective way, 
that pain advantages after two weeks were pretty similar. The advantage of VATS was seemingly uh, gone after a couple weeks and with similar results in pulmonary function, muscle streak, and walking, and they emphasized the need to pay more attention to pain management. This was a, a, a study comparing axillary thoracotomy, uh, that was referred to earlier, versus VATS, uh, found no difference in pain, complications, performance status, or quality of life, but did find some benefit in length of stay and measuring of the C-reactive protein. Uh, this is a prospective trial. This is taken from Memorial Sloan Kettering, one of the few prospective trials uh, looking at these things. They found that in this group of patients, they studied them for 12 months at four time points, both groups the same, uh, that the uh, outcome was that the physical component of their assessment and pain were the same for both the open and the VATS procedures at these four time points. Interestingly, the mental component summary score was worse for those with VATS. They commented that they thought that uh, this was related to the fact that people had uh, an anticipation of a much better, smoother, less painful operation and because that wasn't necessarily the case or didn't live up to their expectations, they had a, a, a worse score in this uh, mental component of their assessment. Cost. Uh, people have made that argument that maybe there's some benefit to VATS lobectomy. Um, this was uh, done from uh, Farhu Farjar uh, at the uh, University of Washington in Seattle looking at this group of patients. Uh, most had had open procedures, about a third had VATS procedures, and found that there was a difference in length of stay when they looked at this cohort of patients, three days versus uh, seven days. Uh, there are, uh, more had a higher length of stay on a percentage basis. And again, VATS slightly uh, performed better in terms of uh, EW visits and readmissions, and that at 90 days, there was a, a, a statistically significant difference in cost. But when you adjusted for length of stay, that statistically significant difference disappeared. And their conclusion in this study is there should be improved strategies to reduce the length of stay. Staging and survival. Well, it's all well and good to talk about all of these subjective things about pain, return to uh, work, quality of life, all of which are very important but they are a distant second to whether or not you're curing cancer. So this analysis, uh, while still confusing, is really the essence of what this should be about. Uh, is it the same operation? Well, many claim it is. It's pretty close, but uh, it seems to me that whenever I hear about it, uh, the sequence is different. The fissure is almost univer universally taken last. Whenever I do that in an open procedure, uh, I always find the nodes in the fissure or near the bronchus, especially in the right upper lobe, uh, to be uh, difficult to incorporate if I take the fissure last. The fissureless lobectomy uh, being uh, proposed to reduce air leaks may also have a problem getting all of the nodes uh, in the fissure. So we'll see how that uh, turns out. It may reduce the air leak problem, but will it get all of the nodes? This is one of the first reports in 2010 uh, comparing open and VATS in terms of lymph nodes. And they, while they're not startling results, they did find that there were generally more nodes found with open procedures compared to VATS. Retrospective, non-randomized. Uh, this uh, author had a small group of patients, uh, found things that were more favorable for VATS, uh, not statistically significant, different in complications. It was a propensity uh, based study, um, uh, and the mean number of lymph, lymph nodes, not statistically different, but certainly a trend to more uh, found in the open group, and the mortality roughly the same, operative mortality. This was uh, American College of Surgeons study, uh, again, a secondary analysis, this was done for another reason, again, found this slight difference in open versus VATS in terms of the number of lymph nodes. They did make the comment that longer follow-up was needed to determine the oncologic equivalency of VATS versus open lobectomy. Uh, this, uh, again, another propensity-matched pairing uh, study. Uh, again, I think that's our attempt to uh, not do randomized control studies. Uh, it's better than not doing that but um, still leaves something to be desired in my mind. 
Uh, and here it showed again that there is this tendency to have more nodes and more stations evaluated doing open procedures, but at three and five years, uh, at least in their analysis, uh, did not find any difference in survival. Uh, this is the STS database, large numbers of patients. This was a study that I think raised a red flag that uh, when you look at these large number of patients, uh, as Peter alluded to earlier, uh, you find that nodal upstaging is uh, on a percent basis uh, much greater than VATS procedures. In this particular analysis, uh, the difference uh, in N1 nodes uh, was uh, significant, the difference in N2 nodes not, and then when propensity matched uh, pairs were done, the N1 um, upstaging uh, held out again for open procedures, at least raising the question that it does that have any impact on survival. No one knows that. Um, I always pay attention to uh, certainly Peter over the years uh, because of the advantages that Denmark has over many other countries in the sense that it's a small country. It has four sites that do thoracic surgery and a near 100% uh, follow-up of the patients who have surgery. So it provides a unique testing ground for some of these uh, ideas. Uh, this, uh, I remember when, when it was presented, kind of confirmed the suspicion that the BAFA paper did using the STS, and that uh, was alluded to earlier, that uh, rather surprising uh, differences in the percent of uh, those who had positive N1 and N2 nodes in clinical stage 1 patients, uh, again, raising this question uh, as to the efficacy from an oncologic standpoint of VATS lobectomy. Uh, this was also done recently, 24 studies reviewed, VATS open. They came to the same general conclusion that there were more N2 nodes and because of that there were more total nodes in open versus VATS, yet one more uh, attempt to raise this issue, which seems to me to be begging for uh, uh, an answer uh, as to its significance. Um, uh, this just shows, again, a, a look at survival, uh, comparing VATS and open. It's a rather small number, but really found no differences here. Uh, one might wonder whether these are, should be higher than 72%, but again, with small numbers, hard to know, underpowered to really make much out of it. Uh, and then this uh, uh, study, again, looking at uh, local recurrence, uh, uh, relatively large numbers of patients, uh, found some benefit uh, to VATS, but the authors uh, um, uh, acknowledge that this is a non-randomized study. Surgeon choice uh, was how they determined which procedure they would do. Uh, selection bias was a major limitation. And that's, they uh, concluded by saying several randomized control studies have been too underpowered to draw any meaningful conclusions regard to survival. Um, those, um, uh, uh, there's been a, uh, at least a sense that uh, chemotherapy is better tolerated uh, in patients who have VATS lobectomies. Um, again, uh, to our uh, thoracic surgeons from Denmark, uh, this study was recently published showing that, in fact, um, there really was no difference in terms of ability to uh, uh, have chemotherapy, and the predictors of compliance were age, comorbidity, and pathologic end status, again, underscoring this difference of upstaging, uh, presumably on the same group of patients. Uh, this one uh, is the most recent paper that's come out. I just saw this uh, this past year. Uh, again, this Scott Swanson is the senior author in this, somebody who's uh, clearly identified with uh, VATS lobectomy. Again, a propensity-matched study, 175 patients. It was part of another study that uh, uh, they were looking at a different question. Um, but again, it came out in favor of VATS in terms of length of stay, complications, and independent home discharge. Survival was comparable at 36 months, not five years, but 36 months in a propensity-matched study, but slightly favored open procedures. Uh, the authors acknowledged the limitations was missing information on lymph nodes from this propensity-matched study, PFTs, 
and that a few institutions in this multi-institutional study contributed the vast majority of patients introducing the bias of uh, these large few large institutions. And they admitted this study is not controlled for surgeon motivation, which I think is a factor uh, when you're just starting out trying to prove something. And they conclude and admit to date, well-designed prospective multi-institutional studies have not been done. So in conclusion, uh, VATS still practiced by the minority of surgeons and I think will be that way for a while until the sort of uh, generation of uh, trainees uh, goes through the process. They go out into the community and eventually change the overall approach to uh, lung cancer. Um, there will always be this uh, unique risk of a learning curve of those who are trying to adopt it, especially if they've not had the benefit of a training program. It seems that there are slight advantages in length of stay, complications, maybe benefit of quality of life, although we saw contradictory evidence to that uh, from Memorial Sloan Kettering, and debatable cost savings. If both sides tried equally hard to get patients out of the hospital, pay attention to cost, would there be a difference? Uh, I'm pretty convinced that if there are no positive nodes, the survival should be the same. That, that seems to make logical sense. But this issue of uh, nodes and being able to get all of the nodes and a higher rate of upstaging with open procedures at least begs the question. I don't know the fate of these patients when they have these undetected nodes that are found at either VATS lobectomy or open lobectomy. It would be interesting to know the outcome of those patients. Uh, uh, and, and maybe the message there is there ought to be better preoperative screening to identify these people uh, if you believe in preoperative therapy changing the overall pattern of uh, survival in this group of patients. Uh, and there is this uh, concern, and clearly there's very little, if any, randomized prospective data. This uh, publication in 2015 from the U.S. Uh, in the Cancer Care Network Journal Surgeons should advocate for specialty care and surgical quality that assures best outcomes regardless of surgical approach. And I guess I would say I echo those sentiments. Gold standard still to me is a randomized prospective study. My guess is it wouldn't change what patients want. Uh, I think most patients want smaller procedures, minimally invasive procedures, but I think we owe it to them to be honest and uh, tell them what uh, the difference. If there was a 5% difference in survival, they ought to know that. Uh, if there was a new chemotherapy agent that came along that showed some promise, I'll bet you everybody would say, yeah, they'll, they'll do a randomized study to see if it has efficacy. And yet, as surgeons, we're reluctant to do that. So this may not clarify anything. It may confuse you. Uh, what did he actually uh, decide based on all this? Uh, that it's a pretty confusing area to look at. Uh, the procedures are remarkable, the things that can be done. Patients clearly prefer it, I think. Uh, but when you look at it uh, carefully, uh, the differences may not be as great as we think. And there is this lingering question, which is the most important thing, is is there a difference in overall survival that could be a few percent, five percent, at least would be uh, a guess that I have. So thank you very much. I doubt that I've added much to... Uh, overall uh, controversy about this, but I uh, appreciate the opportunity. Thank you.